Hey, good morning, everyone. It is just about nine, um, so we're going to get started. I'm in here. This is Jen. I'm in here with Jolyn and Michelle, and I was just telling them that my brain is working very slowly right now because my daughter had a little accident in her bed last night, so I was up in the middle of the night. Please forgive me if I stumble on my words or get lost in a thought. Um, thanks, Paul. I'm working on it. Working on waking up. Um, Bring us coffee, Paul. I already had all my coffee. Bad. Okay. So here's our agenda for the day. We're going to go through um, some upcoming changes for 2020 um, to some um, software systems, to some monthly status report stuff. Um, and then we're also going to give you all back a little bit of the data that you worked so hard in throughout the whole year um, so that we could use it for our MCO grant in November. Um, and there will be some open Q&A time. So increase the size of my agenda. Jody, thank you for pointing that out. Now I just have to just think how to do that. How's that? <sighs> Wonderful. Okay. Um, so again, if you have any questions that you want to chat in either at the end during the open Q&A time or um, as we're going through, please feel free to do that. We always love your questions and they always make me think about how I can better support you with my end of things. Um, and I'll remind you now and at the end that um, we'll be exporting data for your December monthly reports. Um, and I'm going to be doing that on January 2nd. I will be out of the office um, from the 24th until the 2nd with my daughter. So um, please expect those probably the first um, full week of January, those December reports. All right. So we will jump into some recent PHL changes. We've gotten quite a few questions about them. Um, there were some changes made to the vitals tab about three or four weeks ago. I think it might have been right around Thanksgiving. All right. I'm going to change the presenter. Okay. Um, all right. And as always, we do get a lot of questions about how to get a hold of us. If you know of anybody that doesn't know how to get a hold of us, we try to be as accessible as possible. So just send us an email to the session box with PHL on the subject line. And on to the vitals tab. So around Thanksgiving, there was a change made to the vitals tab. Um, and it's a little bit funny. And we've gotten quite a few questions about it because it's not very intuitive. But um, we've been trying to work with PHL to um, better be able to document some of the diabetes work that you are all doing and some of the hypertension work. Um, and I think this is the change that was made as a step in the process. But essentially, the A1C number that many nurses document was kind of taken out and moved and added to the bottom of the vitals tab. And there was also um, a cholesterol area added as well. So people can now document HDL, LDL, triglycerides, or just total cholesterol, any or all of those things at the same time. But you do have to scroll all the way to the bottom past where you would normally document things. So it's a little bit confusing. Um, we're hoping uh, that soon we will be able to add a date that those 
items were drawn on because right now the date in there is just associated with the visit date that you're putting in PHL. So it's not super helpful for a number of reasons, but we will update you when that actually does happen. So I will just give you a quick view of this from the real PHL screen. So this is a vital tab. And normally, as you're working in here, before you would have seen the A1C number right in with all of the other vitals measures, but now you do have to scroll all the way down, past the save button, and past the new table that has just the A1C and cholesterol, and you can find a place to document that here. And you would just do it as normal, put in the number, and then you have to push this save A1C and or cholesterol, and they document at the same time. And then those numbers will appear in this table that's below everything else. All right, so if anybody has questions about that, feel free to chat them in. I do see that Kathleen Pollen chatted in a comment that the PDF reports are not printing properly and that the pain scale are not, the pain scale and edema are not in the correct format. Thank you so much, Kathleen. We have actually been working with PHL on fixing that. Um, and we have a meeting with them scheduled on Friday and I'm hoping that they'll tell us that it's gonna be fixed soon. Um, they did just hire a new developer. So I think that they've been working hard to train up that new person and hopefully we'll see some good changes coming along our way. Any questions about the vitals tab? Okay. Back to my PowerPoint. Okay, so some other common questions that we've been getting into the help desk recently is about moving a participant from one panel to another. So say for example, I was um, I was I was previously working in Heinsberg and I had somebody move to Rutland and I knew that there was a sash panel there. So in the past, as far as PHL goes, you were previously able to move that person to the new SASH panel on your own. But now if you go into STAR and you go into your PHL page and look at your desk aid for moving one participant from one panel to another, you'll see that you're not able to do that process on your own anymore and we have to go ahead and do it for you. It's just a security measure that PHL added in over the summer. Um, so all you have to do is send to the help desk the participant CBO number, the sending panel name, and the receiving panel name. Um, so hopefully this makes it easier for you because it was kind of a cumbersome process to start with. Um, but you might not know where what that receiving panel is. So I just wanted to go with go through with you some of the resources that are on STAR for you to help connect with that um, sending or receiving panel coordinator. Because that warm handoff from one coordinator to another can be super helpful as the participants like going through this really big move. So if you're in STAR, and you're looking at all the headers up here. If you go to staff and panel information and panel contact, it'll bring you right to the sashvt.org website and you can see all of the counties and the little stars are the panels around the counties. So say I knew somebody was moving from a panel in Chittenden County to a panel in Rutland County. I would click on Rutland County and then go to the countywide SASH contact list. And so, for example, if I knew somebody was moving to Castleton, I might not know the name of that panel, but if I look in here, I can see that it's called the Castleton Fairhaven panel and that Colleen is the coordinator there. Um, 
So whenever you have somebody moving from one panel to another, it'd be great to reach out to the new coordinator um, and let them know any important information about that person. Um, and then go ahead and send the, the CBO number and the panel names to the help desk and we can get you that transfer done pretty quickly. Does anybody have any questions about that? We did get a question in about the cholesterol, um, new cholesterol documentation from Linda Bemis. Um, Linda says, sorry, I'm gonna miss something. Maybe what's the best way to find out cholesterol? So. My understanding from Casey is that some nurses are collecting this information and they just previously didn't have a way to document it because it wasn't in the vitals tab prior to this update. Um, that we, SASH doesn't currently have an ask for collecting cholesterol information, but if you are already collecting it or your team knows it and you would like to document it, you can now. Does that answer your question, Linda? Does that sound right, Michelle? Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Linda says yes. That answers her question. All right. So unless there's any questions about moving a participant, I'm going to move along. Um, all right. So next, I wanted to let everybody know that there's going to be some changes coming for the monthly status reports in 2020. So what that what that means will be that first monthly status report that is using data that you're documenting in 2020. So that'll be the report that you get the, at the end of January is when these changes will go into effect. Um, everything will continue to look the same for your December reports that you'll get at the beginning of January. Um, so the first thing that's changing is as you all know, it's really hard to say what a completed assessment is for a variety of reasons. Sometimes participants refuse to do parts of assessments. Sometimes they're not able to do parts of assessments. Um, and so when, you're, when we're talking about the monthly status report, we try to find generally a few things that most people are able to do and call that in a completed assessment because the the coding that I use to make these reports is pretty black and white, and I'm not able to use any gray area that like a normal person would be able to see as a completed assessment, if that makes sense. Um, so going forward, a wellness nurse assessment is going to change, and that's because a lot of folks are starting to use the new alternative assessment that Michelle rolled out in the fall. And because of that, a lot of the questions that were in our previous flag um, are now being done by the SASH participant on their own, and they're not actually seeing the nurse when they're doing those questions. So the, the goal of that completed wellness nurse assessment um, column in the monthly status report is really to let you all see the last time the nurse did an assessment with a participant. Um, and if it's flagging, folks that are just doing the pre-assessment, that's not really what you're looking for. At least we don't think so. So um, the new flag is going to be that the nurse has to um, indicate that the wellness nurse assessment is a, either an initial or a reassessment in the visit reason. And two of the following three things have to be done, and that's going to be um, the, the the tobacco question on the general health assessment. So if we're looking in PHL, that is the general health assessment tab. And I believe the tobacco question is number 15. So if you, if the nurse answers this question, and also, so it's going to be two out of three things. 
a tobacco question, the mini cog. So that's just a, a pass fail on the mini cog. And then the last one is met adherence. So if two out of those three screenings or assessments have been completed and it's been marked as an assessment, then that'll look like a completed assessment in your monthly status report. Um, and because this is a pretty big change um, to what people were previously expecting, I'm, I'm going to send out a new desk aid to go along with this so people can remember what the change was. So please don't I don't think you have to re remember this right now. I'll send out plenty of information for you to look back on. All right, so we're getting a couple of questions in. Kathleen Pollan says, so what happens when a participant declines the mini cog? Great question, Kathleen. So um, this flag is two out of three things. So if the participant does, answers the tobacco question and they also answer the met adherence question, they'll still be marked as complete. Got some more questions and comments coming in. Dana says um, about the wellness nurse assessment is this going to flag additional participants as not having had the wellness nurse assessment, even if they've had it? Um, well, that's kind of a complicated question, Dana. I, Michelle and I and Casey have done quite a bit of testing on this new flag, and I believe it's working. However, you know, you all will kind of be our test subjects a little bit because we haven't run it on every single report, and you all will have your eyes and ears on it much better than we will. But um, just like the old flag, it's not going to be perfect for everyone because there are going to be some special circumstances where it's not going to work. So if you have somebody who refuses to do the mini cog and refuses to do the med adherence, that will show up as the wellness nurse assessment not being complete. But like I said, I, I, because of the black and white nature of how we make these, I can't take into account the gray areas that are out there in the field with you every day. So you and your team will just have to um, find a way to remember those things. I, I think that they will be few and far between, but if they're not, please let us know and we'll make another change to try to correct it. Um, Kathleen Pollan says, can we get a decline on the mini cog itself? There is a way to decline the mini-cog, and it's in the assessment declined area of PHL. Um, but, but all of these are not counted in the flag. Hi, Jen, this is Amy. Can I speak for a second? Um, so Kathleen, good question. At the first of the year, we are going to be rolling out a uh, some updates to the assessment and to PHL connected to the mini cog. Um, so stay tuned. There'll be some kind of updates that'll make it a little bit easier to say that people have declined certain parts of the mini cog and um, the whole thing. Interesting. Okay, cool, Amy. Thanks for the heads up. Yep. Kathleen Pollan is asking, will the MedAdherence tab get additional questions? Um, I guess I don't know what additional questions you might be looking for, Kathleen. Um, so if you have more questions that you would like to see on the MedAdherence, let, let us know. Um, you can just send us an email. I'm not quite sure what, what you're asking about. Um, Kathleen also says that she knows that declines has a section, but it still shows that it's not done. Yes, that's correct. Um, and that is also intentional. Hopefully, 
hopefully when you're working with your participants, they are able to do two out of these three screens is the intention. Um, Melissa Stockholm says, I found that on the MediTerrence tab, if a participant answers that they run out of medications, it's often because the pharmacy doesn't have the medication available. That should be a choice. Otherwise, the reason cannot be completed. That's a great suggestion. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I will, can somebody write, write that down? Yeah. Great. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. We can definitely make that change. Um, Kathleen says, also, doctors don't call in the script sometimes. Can choices be added to the med adherence tab? Absolutely. If you have any more suggestions, like doctors not calling in scripts or the medication not being available from the pharmacy, but let us know and we can add that absolutely. Great suggestions. Thanks, everybody. Okay. We'll have a couple more questions and comments rolling in about this. Dana Holmgren says, the tobacco question is tricky because it, I ask it on initial screen, but I don't ask it on every subsequent year if they're a former smoker. I'm only reviewing current smoking habits with them. Do you have any comments on that, Michelle? Yeah, um, I would just recommend, you should be asking every question every year. Um, and if you know, you know, that they were a previous smoker or they still are, you just check in and say, hey, are you still a non-smoker? Are you, are you, you know, are you still smoking? And so I, I would definitely review that because that is something that can change. Um, so yes, please do ask that question every time you assess someone. Cool. Thanks, Dana. You all have such great questions. I'm glad we're going over this. It's great. Um, okay. So if nobody has any more questions about the new wellness nurse flag, I'm going to move us along. <laughs> okay. Um, also, I wanted to let everybody know that we are adding a new initiative sheet to replace the insurance sheet. So previously, every other month, you all were getting information about your participants' insurance status. Um, we're going to be taking that out and replacing it with a new sheet called initiatives. And these are some items that we are being asked to report out on by our grant funders. Um, and as always, if you would like information about insurance, you can always just send those requests my way, and I'm happy to get that to you on your panel level. Um, but the insurance information wasn't changing very much, and we thought this might be more helpful and um, help your workflow a little bit on some of the newer items that we've been looking at as far as grants and whatnot. I'm going to go over what that initiative sheet is going to look like at the end of this call, but I just wanted to give you a heads up because it is related to some of the data that I'm going to be reporting out on in the next few minutes. Okay. So, does anybody have any more questions about PHL, patient ping, um, any of that stuff before we move on to a slightly different topic? Um, I will also say that I put Care Navigator in here, and that's because in 2020 there's going to be some changes that we're asking uh, folks in Vermont to implement with our Care Navigator system. Um, as hopefully most of you know, in Vermont there's a care coordination software called Care Navigator that's implemented by One Care Vermont, um, and it's going to be connected to some of our funding in 2020. Melissa is working really hard to nail down what those items are, and she'll be doing some training with everybody on these calls in the beginning of the year. So if you have questions about Care Navigator and the changes coming 
stay tuned. We'll be talking about them here during this call in the first few months of 2020. Not sure if it's going to be January or February or what that's going to look like exactly. Um, but yes. Okay. I've got a couple more questions coming in about general system stuff, PHL stuff. Diana Rule asks, how important is adding transitions of care on time? So sometimes people move before I can get in and I'm constantly playing catch up. Diana, are you talking about the transitions of care tab in PHL? Um, if so, yes, she says yes. Um, if so, at this time, we are really only asking people to use that if it's helpful for your team. There is no ask on our end as far as that transitions of care tab. Um, if using that is helpful for your team, please go ahead and do it. Um, but we are not using any of the data in that for any of our grants. We're using mostly the ping data that we're getting from patient ping because it's usually the most accurate. I know there are some black areas around the state of Vermont um, that ping isn't everywhere, but it's kind of the best that we have at this point. Great question. Jody has a wish list for 2020 in PHL. Me too, Jody. Me <laughs> 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 um, too. Request for 2020 referrals for falls. Re reasons should be fall prevention and referral to PCP and home health and physical therapy. Yeah, can you um, can you email that those requests to us, Jody? I'm happy to look at them. We're going to be updating some things in the assessment. So um, we do assessment updates quarterly now, and really. The intention behind those quarterly updates is for any typos to get fixed, any things that we need to take out or add in for a scheduled time to do that. Um, so those are so those changes are going to be happening in early January. So if you could send send those requests our way, we will definitely look at them and get them in there if we're able to. Deborah Mason says, where are we getting this info? Our participants don't usually recall their A1C or cholesterol. We're expecting that they'll be able to locate the report from their latest PCP visit. Good question, Deborah. So there, there's been an initiative started this year with targeted SASH participants around tracking A1Cs for, I believe it's one or two SASH participants for each panel and the nurses in those panels know who those participants are. So really these A1C numbers um, are for like a pretty small subset of SASH participants um, that Casey and the wellness nurses are tracking for um, a VDH grant. But that's also a place that you can track A1Cs for anybody if that is a workflow that's helpful to your team. Um, so those nurses have been calling PCP offices and working with those doctor's offices for those very specific participants. Um, so Deborah has been without a nurse for almost a year now, but she mm -hmm. has a new one just coming on board, so I think she's been trying to probably find this information. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it takes a little bit of legwork, Deb. We can definitely talk about it if you want to reach out. This is Michelle. Um, yeah, but you're absolutely right. It was like one or two, and it was really expected of the wellness nurses to participate, and we understand that in your particular case, that hasn't necessarily been able to happen. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. I was without a wellness nurse for six months for a while, and whew, that was painful. So mm -hmm. a year sounds really tricky. Sorry that was too happening in your area, Deb. Um, Dana is saying a referral for gas vouchers. Um, yes, yeah, send those requests our way. 
can you send them in an email with a little bit more information about how you would use them and why that would be important to you? It's We try not to add too much in there. Um, if it's because it's going to add more paper for us. So if it's really going to help your workflow, let us know why. Um, but yeah, OK. Jody says, you can also send a fax requesting the A1C and cholesterol and vaccination history to the practice for your initial assessments or reassessment. And that's what they do in Barry and Montpelier. And the coordinator or the nurse can request it. She says it's cumbersome, but it works. It was a great suggestion. Thank you, Jody. Awesome. Oh, great. You all, all are just brainstorming over here. Good. I'm loving it. OK. What else is on my to-do list? OK. So you are keeping me fresh, Jody. Always. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as promised, um, I, we asked you all to put information in the system for our MCO grant that we reported out on in mid-November. And I said I would come back and let you know what that looked like, and here I am. So I've got a couple of charts and a little bit of data for you all on what we reported out on. So, um, and I kind of put them in categories of SASH successes and areas of growth. So there's always things that we're good at, and there are always things that we could improve on. Um, so this isn't meant to be a critique of anybody or any part of our work. It's just uh, a nice frame to look at this data from. So an important thing before I jump into it is the grant reporting period for the MCO grant is a six-month period. So when we're talking about numbers, we would really be looking at capturing about half of our SASH participants. So for example, the falls risk assessment, they ask us about how many people we screen from May 1st until October 31st of 2019. Um, so we were able to screen 37% of our SASH participants in that six month period which is a little bit low, because if we're talking about six months, we would probably expect to see about 50% of our participants being screened for falls risk. Um, and 30 or 59% of those that were screened were at risk of falling, which I don't think is surprising to anybody. But it's, it's interesting. All right. So connected to falls risk is our falls prevention work, which we rock at. Um, so falls prevention work from around the state. So the MCO grant asks us what we're doing to prevent falls. And we get that information from those monthly evidence-based practice surveys that you all fill out for Amy, asking about what kind of programs you're offering. So. We know that we're offering bone builders, Tai Chi, and matter of balance for evidence-based practices, along with a lot of other things that are definitely helping, but not necessarily in that evidence-based practice realm. Um, we served 1,017 SASH participants in that six-month period of time in those three programs. It's really amazing. Very cool. And also this. SASH participant, this is a SASH participant, and her upper body strength is much better than mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were all yeah. like, oh my god, she looks great. Yeah. Okay. So the next thing um, that you all report out on for those monthly evidence based practice surveys that get sent to Amy, that JOT form that she asks you to fill out, are the CDSMP workshops. So that's diabetes prevention diabetes management, RAP, chronic disease management, tobacco cessation. So we offered quite a few workshops around the state. Um, and we had 123 SASH participants finish those workshops, which is really amazing because I think everybody knows how hard it is to get people to finish those workshops. And let alone have enough people to get those workshops to start. 
Um, so that's a good success. I know that um, from talking to Amy, there will be some changes in the priorities of these workshops for 2020. Amy, do you have any have anything to say about that? Uh, yeah, so the focus of the state of the Vermont is around tobacco and diabetes. And so the majority of the classes offered um, in the next year, which I sent an email out around about, it will be on tobacco and diabetes. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Did have a, yeah, we had a question from Dem Mason. If some other agency is offering an evidence-based program in our area, should we be reporting out on it? And I believe the answer is no. We're just reporting on what we are offering. That's correct, yes. Um, and also, I wanted to let you know, remind folks that a lot of these things, um, you can let the folks that help provide these workshops know that you have a participant that's interested by um, signing them up at myhealthyvt.org. So that just will let them know that they have you know, X number of people interested in the diabetes prevention program. And so they'll know when they have potentially a full class. All right, <clears throat> moving right along. We also offered 17 workshops around Vermont for financial exploitation, which is amazing. Uh, that serves 217 SASH participants um, that were able to finish them. So I think a lot of these things are sponsored by Cove or what's the other one, Amy? Savvy Seniors? There's actually a couple of other ones, but the majority of them were done by Cove. So if you would like to see something like that in your area, you can reach out to Cove or Savvy Seniors and get that going for 2020. Um, all right, next, moving on to more kind of CHL assessment data. Um, from May 1st to October 31st, we were able to screen SASH participants for their alcohol use. 49% um, of them were screened, which is absolutely on the mark. That's what we would expect to see in a six month period. So you all are rocking that question. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so one thing that our grant funders are asking us about is how often we're providing our participants information about their alcohol use when we know that they are using alcohol. And that's definitely an area of growth that we could improve on. So for example, 5% of those that were screened um, report having four or more drinks um, at some time during the year. So four or more drinks for an older adult is Quite a, quite a bit of alcohol consumption, but only 23% of those folks were given alcohol education. Um, the alcohol education brochures are available on STAR. They're located right next to where you can print off your new assessments. So feel free to print off a bunch of those. We do have nice glossy versions of them here in the SASH office. So if you want some fancy ones, we can get you those. Um, we have a couple of comments coming in. Um, Kathleen says, can the drug and alcohol questions in PHL have a choice of declined info? Um, I don't know. Decline the education or declined answering if they drink alcohol or not. Okay, she says we assess someone but they declined us leaving any brochure information. Okay, um, interesting. I'll, I'm going to write that question down. Thank you, Kathleen. Moving forward, so the next graph is very similar 
kind of question, but you'll see that the, how much we're asking it is very different. So we're asking our participants if they ever misuse prescription drugs or use illegal drugs. And this question only got answered 31% of the time between May and October. And again, we would expect to see 50% of the time um, in that time period. Um, so that's definitely an area for growth. 1% of those that were screened are reporting misusing or using um, legal drugs. And only 23% of those, that 1% were given drug education. So this is a pretty big area of growth for us. And it's also a pretty hard conversation to have about drug use, about drug misuse. Um, there's, there's just so much involved in this, this question that um, not quite sure why, why the question isn't being asked very frequently, but um, it's, it's so important, especially in our state right now with so much drug misuse happening. Um, I think a lot of people have been finding when, when they're doing those drug uh, opioid education pieces at the site that a lot of our participants are really realizing how their family members might be impacted by um, drugs. And it's just an interesting thing to see that we still don't really know how this is affecting our participants. So do you have any thoughts or questions about why this isn't being asked very often? Please let us know. We were getting some comments. Um, Diana says, I'm seeing unintentional misuse for getting meds, taking too many when they remember <clears throat> or um, remember more than using on purpose. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a, um, a funny thing to be asking about because there are some gray lines there between um, misuse and forgetting and those kinds of things. I think if people have questions like that, they can probably send them to Casey about how to answer when those kinds of things are coming up. All right, moving forward. So pre-diabetes screening success. In the late part of the summer, we launched adding the new ADA pre-diabetes screening tool to the assessment. Um, and you all have done over 500 of those from August to the end of October, which is really, really impressive considering that you know, we probably wouldn't be doing these on people that already are diagnosed with prediabetes or diabetes. So this is a, a really great proportion of our staff participants that have been screened by this and are getting sent to see their primary care doctor about potentially having prediabetes. So thank you all for your hard work on using this new screening tool. It's very impactful. Um, right. Medication adherence. So I believe last January, we added the medication adherence tool to the assessment. So those are those questions about if people are missing meds and why they're missing meds. Um, some people brought up some really great instances of why they might be missing meds that we could add to this. Um, but this screening tool isn't being used very much at all. So um, between May and October, only 12% of SASH participants were screened for med adherence. Um, and certainly there are some SASH participants that might not be on meds, but I think the vast majority of them are. And if they are, then um, our grant funders are asking us to see um, how they're using those medications. So this is a gigantic area of growth for us um, and definitely something that we can show our success on next year. Because, um, because THL is kind of tricky to see who has what screenings in there, we're going to be adding the med adherence screening into the wellness nurse panel management 
cheat in the monthly status report starting the end of January. So that'll be easier for you all to find out if those people have been screened in the last year or not. Um, so getting close to the end here, I wanted to give you all a preview of what that new initiative sheet's gonna look like in the monthly report starting the end of January. So a lot of this stuff is um, connected to the MCO grant stuff that we just went over. So you're gonna see information about how many people are prescribed an opioid. So anybody that has an opioid in their medications tab, you'll see that in the column C. You'll see the most recent date that they were assessed for drug misuse and if they were given education. The most recent date that they were screened for alcohol use and if they were given um, education. Their most recent suicide screening date and if they were at risk for suicide. We also added the PSSRS follow-up in there because um, Melissa and the suicide screening initiative that we're doing, we're wanting to make sure that those people that are screening positive for suicide risk are being followed up with the CSSRS. Um, so that'll be in there. And last but not least is the most recent date of the UCL, UCLA screening. That's um, the loneliness screening. So I'm again, I'm gonna be putting out a new desk aid for where all this information is coming from in PHL. Um, and sending it out with those new reports. So if you have questions about this, after you look at all of that documentation that I'm gonna to send to you with these first reports, please let me know. Um, and again, you can expect this the end of January. All right, we've got a question coming in from Melissa saying, so if a participant does not have any meds, there will be a place, will there be a place that it can be noted so it doesn't look like it was missed? Um, we, um, I can tell in the system if somebody doesn't have any medication, so. I think she's asking about the new wellness nurse flag. Mm -hmm. So. I would say, hopefully, you know, you're asking the tobacco question and that person will go through the mini cog. Right. So it's often time, you know, that happens or one of those three questions might not, or three screens might not get asked for whatever reason. Um, so hopefully the other two will make up for that. Yeah. Rarely there will maybe be somebody who, who doesn't do two of them, but then you'll, that's just something that you're gonna have to keep track of. Unfortunately, there's no, perfect way to make that flag. I tried, but I couldn't do it. <laughs> um, all right. So, updated assessment material. So again, we're gonna update the assessment to um, take out things, add things, um, update typos, all that stuff quarterly going forward. So please, 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 um, make it a part of your workflow to recycle your old assessments and print new ones um, on a quarterly basis. We're always going to let you know when those changes have been made. Um, I do think that some of the reason that we're not seeing as much data on some of the stuff that we went over today is because there are quite a few people that print off a whole bunch of paper assessments and then they don't have the new questions that might be, um, that might be in there. So you can find new paper assessments on STAR, under STAR tools, and the, the education materials are right underneath those as well. Um, so again, when you're on STAR, dash tools, assessment tools, and from here, you can print off any version of the traditional workflow or the alternative workflow along with um, some of the other tools that go along with the assessment, including the education brochures. So please do that. Um, and right now, if you all have any questions for me, please chat those in. Um, but if not, I will give you back 10 minutes of your day. Thank you so 
much for the work you've been doing this year. Um, you and your team talked to you all in 2020. You're all amazing. All right. Bye, everyone.